Okay, so last week, he said it was time for a heart check, right? Now, I'm going to be really honest with you, because I legitimately had a heart check kind of all week long. Anybody else have a heart check, actually, after he preached about having a heart check? So, have you ever had an opportunity to be really grateful for something? Like, you know this is a good thing, and then you realize you're just not quite being very grateful for that good thing that you have in front of you. So I have this wonderful husband and I have a wonderful father. Yes, yes, you guys can celebrate him. And, and he's a wonderful father to our four kiddos. So he has been doing this special little thing. Whoopsie daisy. He's been doing this special little thing since our oldest daughter was eight years old. And now we have another little girl that's eight years old. And when our daughters turn eight, he takes them just he and them on a special daddy daughter trip. And it's so sweet. This is where you all say, oh, he talks to them for like months about where they want to go and they get to pick the location and just the two of them, they go on a trip and they go and they hang out. Now, I'm not going to give all of the details because, you know, he's the story guy and he remembers details like an elephant. It's wild. It's shocking. He's going to share all about his trip. But I will tell you, he took our little Daphne, our little eight-year-old Daphne to Dollywood this last week. So, so sweet. And the whole time, I'm literally thinking... Oh, what a blessing that I have such a wonderful husband that he's investing into my daughter. He does the same thing with our sons because we can't leave the boys out. But, well, only our one son because the other one is still five. He's not there yet. However, I was so grateful and I was so excited for this special time that Daphne was getting with her daddy because she'd been so excited. And at the same time, I was legitimately pouting all week long that I didn't get to go the whole week. Well, it was only three days, but it felt like a whole week. It felt like two weeks. The whole time they were gone, I was literally thinking, I, oh, I'm so excited for you, but I wish I was there. I wish I could go and have fun. I want to go and be the fun mom. You get to go and be the fun dad. I want to go and do nothing responsible, only fun things. Is, are there any other moms in the house that would completely just concur a little bit? Just a little bit. But then I would snap myself out of it and say, okay, no, but have a right attitude because this is, this is a good thing. And then he would send me picture after picture and video after video of the sweetest, most wonderful moments. And the whole time, I was not able to enjoy my week and my day because I was wishing that I was doing something else, even though it was a really, really good thing. So during this week, where the Lord was checking my heart and I was praying about, okay, what am I, whew, what shall I preach this next week? Because you're checking my heart in the midst of it. The Lord asked me to share with you all about attitudes of the heart, y'all. Attitudes of the heart. And he said, I'm going to start with yours. So if any of you are like, you're preaching something that you don't take personally, it's real personal, y'all. I just came out of a week where the Lord was correcting my own attitude Anybody ever had a bad attitude before? I see, I see like tw literally like 20 hands maybe. I think the rest of you are struggling today. So Lord, just open their hearts for clarity. <laughs> Let them see themselves how they really are. All right, so we are praying about attitudes of the heart. And actually, this is a message. Are you guys up to being challenged today? You okay with that? Because I wanna challenge you. I don't want to challenge your neighbor. I don't want to challenge your spouse. I don't want to challenge your kids. I want to challenge you today. I want you to say, how does that apply to me? Lord, reveal in me what I need to grow in. Are you all up for that? Yes. Can you do it? Okay. All right. Because it starts in the what? In the heart. It all starts in the heart. How do we know this? Because Proverbs 4.23 tells us that. It says, guard your heart above what? Above all else, for it deter determines the course of your life. The NIV says, everything you do flows from it. The King James Version says, for out of it come all of the issues of life. Your heart is so significant. The condition of your heart is so very 
important. So today, we're going to look at it a little bit differently, but I want to start with the words of Jesus. We are going to be talking about mostly red letters in the word today. Jesus had multiple conversations in the Bible with the Pharisees, with the teachers of the law. So at this time, he hadn't gone to the cross yet. So the law was literally the law of Moses. So the law, the instruction manual for godly living, it was what they just considered the law. And they had what were called teachers of the law. They were literally the legal experts in Old Testament times. They were the lawyers of the day. And they believed in God. They did. They believed in God, but there was one thing that shifted it a little bit, and that thing was that their values aligned more in their traditions and their practices than they really did in the actual heart of God. And because of that, they continually butted heads with Jesus. Literally, they butted heads with Jesus all the time. You can see it in the word consistently consistent butting heads with Jesus, which I take really, really personally. I just don't understand it. I'm a loyalist. I'm always like, what? Why are you coming at him all the time? Literally, he is the the one performing the miracles, the one delivering people, the one setting people free, and they are constantly calling him out in public like there is something that they have to prove. And I believe that the reason that they butted heads with Jesus so often so often, was because their attitude toward the law blocked their ability to see the Messiah. Their attitude toward the instructions of God blocked their ability to see the Messiah, the chain breaker, the way maker, the deliverer, the redeemer, blocked all of those things that Jesus was doing in the moment because of their attitude toward the instructions. And my honest question for you today that I want you to ponder right there for yourselves, right there at your seat, is if you are really, truly being really honest with yourself, how many of you can see that this is probably where you find yourself sometimes? How many of you would say, I find myself sometimes blocked from the blessings and the provisions of God because of the attitudes of my own heart. Maybe you're able to admit it yet right now. Maybe you're not yet, but I want you to keep thinking about it with me because how many of you have ever found yourself at a spot where you said, wait, 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 wait. God, you want me to do what? You want me to give what up? How on earth would I be able to live my life without that? Why is it so important or significant that I discontinue that? You want me you want me to give to God's house? How, how can I give? What am I supposed to give off of, Lord? How am I supposed to discontinue that relationship? How am I supposed to follow these instructions? You want me to love who? That's a hard one, right? Some of us find ourselves saying, wait, 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 God, literally. What about the person who literally just filled my cup up full with ice when I said just a little light ice? What about that person? Am I supposed to love that person even though they annoy me? What about the DoorDash person who was seven minutes late when I was literally waiting at the door like, where's my food, right? What about that? What about the people that don't function exactly like we want them to function right at the time that we want them to function in? What about those people? Are we supposed to love that person, that guy? I want to challenge you because just maybe, just maybe, Like those that butted heads with Jesus, maybe your attitude is keeping you from seeing the Messiah move in your own life. Maybe it's your attitude that is blocking you from seeing the blessing that you're standing in the middle of or that God is trying to shove you out of the way of so that he can place it in your life. Because again, family, everything comes from what? From the heart. Everything comes from the heart. So Jesus was constantly, he was constantly um, having these traps set for him by these teachers. They would publicly ask him questions, thinking that they were going to trip him up. And he would answer their questions in all humility and end up just embarrassing them left and right. Which sometimes when I read, I giggle at because that wasn't his intention. But because of the way in which they asked, the heart in which they asked, 
It was often what happened. Why was that? It was because their hearts were not submitted to God. Just their own words. Just their words. How many times have you heard us say that we do not want to be a people who only submit to God from our mouths with our words? We need to submit from our whole hearts, family. Our whole hearts. It starts in the what? Starts in the heart. Relationship with Jesus starts in the heart, right? Hearing from God, it starts where? Starts in the heart. Gaining wisdom, favor, and strength. It starts in the heart. So let's look today at a story that Jesus told about a good Samaritan. Okay, y'all know the story about the good Samaritan, right? This isn't a new story necessarily. I mean, this story has been paraphrased and told in kids' books. It has been told everywhere. But I want to look at it from a different angle today. There's something that is so very important. I can't tell you this story without explaining why Jesus told it. So let's start not at the beginning of the story of the Good Samaritan, just a few verses before that. We're going to look at Luke chapter 10, verse 25. It says, one day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus. So this is the person I was telling you about. They stood up. They did this all the time. But this particular one, he's trying to test Jesus by asking him this question. He says, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I don't know if you can hear the criticism in the question or not, but the truth is this person that's asking the question was considered a teacher of the law, and he's standing before Jesus, who is now being referred to as teacher, and he's saying, oh, okay, all right, so let's see what you know. Teacher, teach me what is the way to eternal life. So Jesus' response, which I love here, Jesus sees what he's doing, and Jesus replies, well, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? He says, well, you go ahead, answer your own question. You know all the things. Go ahead, you got this. And the man answers, smugly, I'm sure. I can imagine that it was smugly. That's my interpretation. The man answers, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, says Jesus. Right answer, he says. And then he says, do this and you will live, because this was the rule. This was what the Jews in the time repeated continually. This is the way to eternal life. We have to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, with our whole soul, every portion of our life. But then he goes on to ask something else that's so important. Stay with me here. He says, it says the man wanted to justify his actions, his actions in life. So he asked Jesus, um, and who is who is my neighbor? Who is that neighbor part? The person that I'm supposed to love, right? Who is, who's my neighbor? Then Jesus replies with a story, and this is where the Good Samaritan story starts. He says, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Now, I have to pause there. Jesus never answered anything flippantly. Jesus never said anything in a moment that he didn't have real reason behind saying it. He was giving himself clout when he told this teacher of the law. He was saying, all right, true story. This is a real story. There was a Jewish man, and he was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, something that you have to know about this story is Jerusalem to Jericho is literally a massive swing in their positioning above sea level. Jerusalem is 2,500 feet above sea level. Jericho is 800 feet below sea level, and there's only 17 miles between the two. So what does that mean for those that don't have mathematical minds and are like, what, uh, what do I care about that? For those of you that are curious, that means this was a steep and rocky terrain. This was a route that was very difficult to pass. And literally anyone who'd ever gone from Jerusalem to Jericho knew that this road is dangerous. And part of the reason it's dangerous is because thieves love this route. Because if you are hiking along that trek, you're not really paying attention. And it's pretty easy to rob you at this point, okay? So Jesus gives himself clout in this story when he's speaking to the teacher of the law. He gets his, he gets his attention at this point. And he says, this man, he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him up. They left him half dead beside the road. And by chance, a priest came along. 
But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and kept on going. Unbelievable. And then a temple assistant, a Levite, his job in the temple is literally to assist the priest. He comes walking by. He looks at him lying there, and he also steps over to the other side of the road and keeps going. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, what did he do? He felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged him. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, two denarii, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, this is Jesus. He says, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to that man? Which of these three showed love to the man that had been attacked. And what did the man reply? He said, I anticipate, with his head down a little bit, he just kind of got put in his place there. He says, uh, the one who, showed, the one who showed, showed him mercy. And Jesus says, all right, now go and do the same. So something that is so important to note about this story, number one, it is told by a Jew of the time. Number two, it is told to a Jew of the time. And in this story, number three, it is about a Samaritan hero, which is essentially like an oxymoron at the time. The Jewish people and the Samaritan people, they more than disliked one another. They despised one another. They thought they were the worst people around. Specifically, the Jewish people thought the Samaritans were essentially like trash. They had no respect for them. It was really, really horrible the way that they treated one another. And Jesus tells a story as a Jew making the Samaritan the hero in the story. This is so interesting at the time. And the teacher of the law looks at this story and he says, yeah, it's really hard to answer, but the one who showed the love of God was, ugh, it was the Samaritan. Why? Because it wasn't about who the person was. It wasn't about their standing in life. It was about the attitude of their heart. Jesus said, the Samaritan, the one who showed love in the midst of a not ideal situation, he was the one who was obedient to God's word. Family, the story of the good Samaritan, it reveals a deeper, a deeper issue here. It reveals an issue of the heart. It's one of those, ah, I see. I see why I really came moments. It's like when you go to the grocery store and you're like, I'm, I'm going to grab a box of cereal. That's all I have that I'm going to be getting today. And then you leave with 45 other things and you're like, ah, I see why I really came. It's a full shopping trip, right? There was a time you've heard Pastor Daniel tell this story before, but there was a time we've experienced it multiple times, but one I remember as vividly as he does, which is so good. So I can tell it too. It's amazing, but I won't tell all the details. But we, this was years and years ago, and he and I were at a coffee shop, and we had been ministering all over, and we thought we were going to this coffee shop to, to sit down and have a cup of coffee and be kind of quiet for a minute. Just sit still. We thought we were maybe even going to read a book. That sounded amazing. So we go there, we sit down with our coffees, and I literally lock eyes with the girl across the room upon immediately sitting down. And very quickly, she made her way right over to us. And I realized, ah, oh, I didn't come here for coffee at all. This sweet girl needs Jesus. And the Lord brought her over to us. That was a moment where we realized, ah, oh, I thought I came here for this one thing. But really, the Lord was doing something different. The story of the Good Samaritan, we learn a good lesson about what it is to be a neighbor. But I believe the Lord is delivering a different story in this. Because the truth is... The story was not told just about eternity or about loving a neighbor. He wanted the Pharisee to have a heart check in this moment. The Pharisee had a wrong attitude. The teacher of the law, he had a wrong attitude towards God's word. You see, you can have all the right rules, all the right expectations, all the right expectations in faith and still be filtering your life through the wrong attitude of the heart and completely miss the mark for what God is trying to show you, for what God wants you to see in your life. 
There is always an opportunity in life. I want you to hear me on that. There's always an opportunity in life. I want us to look at the book of James, chapter one, verse two. I love the New Living Translation of this verse. It says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind, that means when difficulties, when hardships, when challenges, when frustrations, troubles of any kind, when they come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Consider it an opportunity for great joy. What does that mean? An opportunity. This means, as Pastor Daniel said last week, he said life is going to keep on lifing, right? Life is just going to keep coming back around and they're going to keep being scenarios outside of your control, situations that you didn't expect, didn't know were going to happen. Life will continue to produce the opportunity. It does that. Life produces the opportunity and your heart provides the response. Life produces the opportunity and your heart provides the response. That response to life can be a response of joy and forgiveness or it can be a response of offense and anger and frustration. But the key here is, the key is that we remember Life's going to continue giving the opportunity. My heart is going to continue responding. The key is you have to decide your response beforehand. You have to decide how you will respond in life before you stumble upon the person in need, before you are the person in need. You have to decide what the word of God says you are called to be and how you are called to live and decide today, this is who I will be according to the word of God. This is my decision to make right now. Before I encounter the storm, before I encounter the difficulty, before I encounter that battle that's probably coming at some point, you have to decide now who you will be at the end of the day, at the end of every day. It is your choice. We have an opportunity, family. We have an opportunity to choose great joy, knowing that just like Jesus said in John 16, in this life, we're gonna encounter some rough patches, right? In this life, we're gonna walk through some stuff, but take heart. I have overcome the world. We should find great joy in knowing nothing takes the Lord by surprise. Not one thing. We decide beforehand. Our hearts must be trained to respond to the word of God. Our hearts have to be trained by that. You don't have to have grown up in a family where they were great trainers biblically, where they taught you all the things, left you a wonderful example. That doesn't have to be your story. You know what you have to have? You have to have the word of God. You have to have your very own Bible. You have to choose to read it. You have to choose to understand God's heart. And you have to choose to say, oh, wait, that, that's a little different than I'm living. That challenges me a little bit. I need to surrender this part of my life to the Holy Spirit and allow him to shift me so that I can look more like Jesus at the end of this very day. Because I'm not going to pass through one day without experiencing a shift from the presence of God. That is the opportunity that we have, family. We have the opportunity to be changed by the presence of God every single day. But you have to be aware of the condition of your own heart. None of us will naturally just do what's right all the time. None of us are going to do that. I don't care what your personality is. I don't care how great you are. I don't care about any of those things. The truth is, if you do not choose how you are going to respond in life before you encounter it, you will not always make the right decision. These are called standards. And according to the word of God, God has called us to rise above the standard of the age, rise above the standard of the culture, rise above the current expectation of our society and live at a different standard. We don't dip down below that because the word sets that for us. We choose it every day. We choose it. We must make a choice ahead of time, according to the word. 
Now, it's easy to look at the story of the Good Samaritan and see a few things. It's easy to say, yeah, that priest, he did not step up in that moment, did he? He should have, literally. It's his job to have compassion, right? And we can also look very easily and see the Levite. We can easily look and see the temple assistant. He didn't step up in the moment either, did he? And he should have. It's so easy to look and say that because it was his job to assist the most compassionate people around. He should have. It's also pretty easy, if you're looking closely, to notice that the Samaritans were so awful in this period of time. This was their reputation. They were so awful that this guy, he was given the one singular title of good. This one Samaritan, because clearly all the rest just weren't. So when you read it and you think the Good Samaritan, you think that that's just a descriptive of the Samaritan. But actually, it's talking about the singular good Samaritan, the one good Samaritan. This story is literally about how much this people group was struggling at this point in time. And the story that Jesus tells is this is about one good Samaritan. He was saying it is, it doesn't matter at all who you are. It matters what your heart is. It matters what you choose in a moment. It matters how you respond to the need. It matters how obedient you choose to be. It matters what you choose. It's also really easy to see that the teacher of the law struggled to see people and not labels even though he was supposed to keep everyone adhering to the order of God's kingdom. It's easy to see these things when you're looking for them. Why? Because I believe that there were some attitudes of the heart that were present here. And I want to talk about a few of those because I want y'all to check your heart in this space and make sure that you do not align with any of these. The first one I want to talk about is the obvious one. That is the arrogant heart. I see a lot of arrogance in this story from multiple different people. I can look at the teacher of the law. Oh, so arrogant. He had all of the answers. No one else possibly could have because he had them, right? I also see the priest. In the moment, he was so arrogant, I would describe, that when he saw a person in need, not only did he look away, but he chose to step to the other side. Now, culturally, there are potential reasons why he did that, but... I also see arrogance there. I also see the same arrogance from the Levite who from this translation literally walked up, looked at him, realized, yeah, this guy needs help. It's probably not gonna be me. And chose to step to the other side. I see so much arrogance here, even though culturally it may have been acceptable in a moment, but family, great men and women of faith fall every single day because of an arrogant spirit that comes in very easily that says, ah, you've got this. People love you. You know all the answers. You don't need to humble yourself down to that spot. They should be listening to you more often. You know all of this. An arrogant heart is not a place we want to find ourselves. Say, I don't want an arrogant heart. And I hope you mean it because it's so important that we refuse it. Philippians 2 verses 3 through 5 says, don't be selfish and don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. And this last sentence I think is so important. It says you must have the same, what? Attitude that Christ Jesus had. We have to die to that arrogance every single day. Amen? The arrogant heart is the first one. The second one that I see is the wounded heart. But what I see here is the potential for a wounded heart. I see the Jewish man that was beaten. I see him hopefully recovering later on. I see him getting better and I see him looking back and I see him having the potential to realize not only was I beaten, I was abandoned. I was rejected by the people that should have helped me. I was left alone in my time of need. I wasn't important enough for somebody to stop whatsoever, except for someone that didn't like me even a little bit. I see a great opportunity here for wounds in this space. 
Because the truth is, he was abused. The truth is, he was neglected. But if he chooses to focus on that, the wounds are what he will receive in his heart instead of the help that came from the Samaritan. See, a wounded heart, even though a wounded heart, it, we should never look past it. What happened to him wasn't okay. What happened to him was unacceptable. It was inexcusable, and it was awful. And it happens in life. It does. But the truth is, we can live like a victim, or we can live like a victor. We can choose to live in the moment of the pain, or we can choose to live in the understanding of the one that redeems us from the pain. We can choose to feel it, oh, so very much, and stay there. Or we can say, that shouldn't have happened. It's not the heart of God for me, but my God will turn this around and make this a testimony of his victory in my life. I love I love 1 Corinthians 15, 57. It starts with, but thanks be to God. I love this because the moment that we stop giving thanks to God, the moment that we start forgetting all of the times he redeemed, all of the times he showed up when nobody else would, all of the times he healed, all of the times he saved, all the times he provided, all of the electric bills that never got turned off, all of the groceries that somehow got bought, all of the children that survived their teenage years. When we stop thanking God, for those moments, that's the moment we find ourselves living in the victim space in life. Instead of recognizing he made you to be more than a conqueror and he will bring you up out of the place in which you fall down if you allow him to. But we have to see him there, the Messiah, ready to save, ready to redeem, ready to restore the rest of the scripture says, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ? Family, the victory is ours, but you got to take hold of that victory. You have to remember whether it's a simple understanding or it is so deep and rich in your life, you have the victory if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. So important. We do not want a wounded heart. And the third heart is a willing heart. I see a willing heart in this story as well. Now, a willing heart doesn't come either from great genetics, amazing parents, doesn't even come from great wealth. A willing heart comes from a wholly surrendered heart to the Lord. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. That means let us press in deeper to our understanding of the heart of God. Grow closer in our relationship with Jesus that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I want a willing heart every day. Why am I telling you this? Because wrong attitudes of the heart lead to conditions of the heart. When we allow these attitudes to remain and reside inside of us, they can become long-standing conditions in our life that keep us long-term from seeing the bigger picture of what God would like to do, keep us stuck in the space where we find ourselves asking year after year after year, decade after decade after decade, God, when's it my turn? When's it my turn? Can I ask you about your attitude? Can I ask you about your posture towards Jesus? Can I ask you about what he's been trying to deliver into your life? Are you open and receptive? Do you have a willing heart? Or do you have a heart that looks more like a wounded heart, like an arrogant heart, like a prideful heart? Matthew 15, 18 says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. Those are the things that make someone unclean. Those are the things that really, really make someone the ugly version of themselves that they never desired to be. It's not always that something or someone is pure evil. When we talk about guarding your gates, when we talk about being cautious about the relationships that you find yourself, when we talk about being cautious about the movies that you watch, the music that you listen to, things you put in your eyes and ears, it's not because they're pure evil. 
It's not because what we're talking about are just the worst thing around possible. No, it's because we guard our hearts because of the impact that could be left on it. Anything you let in there, family, will leave an imprint upon you. What kind of imprint do you want to be reflected in every single breath that you breathe, in every single step that you take? What do you want to be reflecting? Because whatever you put in will be the thing that reflects out of your heart immediately. Wrong attitudes of the heart, they lead to conditions of the heart. But guess what right attitudes do? Right attitudes leave you with freedom. How many of you that have just been through our freedom encounter know that freedom feels real nice? Freedom is real good. When we understand how Jesus has set us free, when we understand the opportunities that we have for joy, the hope that we can walk in, even when people around us seem kind of hopeless, there's great freedom in that. So how do we fix these attitudes of the heart? Because most of the time, they are sincerely in hiding and they only pop up when we are either being challenged, when we are overly comfortable or when we are feeling betrayed. I think sometimes when we see these attitudes in our heart, we have a little bit of a a -a whack-a-mole tendency. You know that the game whack-a-mole, you know, or the little, whatever they are, they're like badger, moles, it's a mole. Okay, sorry about that. (laughs) Whack the mole, it's a mole, all right. Forget that one. Just forget I said it. You know when the little mole pops up in the game and then you hit it to try to make the mole hop back down, right? This is the tendency we have when we see ugly things, ugly attitudes coming up out of us. We're literally like, no, 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 no. I don't want me to see that one. No, no, cover that one up quick. Don't put that back in there. Don't let anybody see that. The whack-a-mole mentality of how to repair the attitude of the heart is not right. But I do want to give you another alternative and amazingly it's another fishing analogy how many of you know that oddly i provide fishing analogies not a fisherman at all not a fisherwoman i don't fish however somehow i always have fishing analogies maybe it is that somehow um my my social media reels my algorithms are just they're down fishing lanes i don't know why but i go down deep long trails on fishing stories it's wild So we don't want to have the whack-a-mole mentality, right? But what we do want to have is the beach worm fishing mentality. How many of you know what a beach worm is? Anybody. There's really next to nobody. Okay, so I am going to explain to you what a beach worm is from my limited understanding. But again, I have oddly studied beach worms a lot, weirdly. So beach worms are in beaches and they are very, very long worms that go way down deep into the sand in the low tide areas. And they can be up to like nine to 10 feet long, like a skinny, weird little flatworm that goes all the way down into the sand. Now, the only reason people know about these is because fishermen um, know that they will come to the surface at low tide moments because they feed on like dead carcasses and things. And they pop their little head up just above the sand, just enough. And fishermen, they grab them and they use them for fishing. So the only way to retrieve a beach worm is when it pops its little head up above the sand. You literally have to stick your finger down into the sand and yank the whole thing out of the water just at the right time. It is absolutely weird and wild, which is why I told you about it, because I want you to remember, you cannot whack and stuff down these bad attitudes in your heart. You have to see it, acknowledge it, grab it, yank that thing all the way out and not allow any roots to remain in your life. You have to have a beach worm mentality. Can y'all remember that one thing today? Beach worm. I'm going to be like a beach worm and get rid of these awful attitudes in our hearts. I don't know why. I don't know why I use these illustrations, but you remember it. So I'm going to give you three simple steps that hopefully you can remember too. Number one, start with your priorities. Start with your priorities. What really matters in your life? And I don't mean what you talk about mattering. I mean what people can see actually matters in your life. I mean, what are you investing into into your life? I mean, where does your time go? What really matters in your life? And what do you submit before the Lord? 
Because if all we're submitting are the big house purchases and the moves across state and who I'm going to marry, if that's all we're submitting to the Lord, then you are missing the day-to-day conversations where you get to learn the voice of God, where you get to understand that God cares about the smallest little details of your life, and they are so very valuable in your relationship. Luke 16, verse 15 says, He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. Playing that whack-a-mole game, and you're not hiding it from God. God knows. He sees it. This next sentence, though, is a little painful. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. The things that we determine as oh so important, God's like, y'all have no clue. That has no bearing on any kind of eternity or long-standing effect on your life whatsoever. But instead, we can look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 from the message translation. I love it. It paints the best picture of what a right heart really looks like. It says, watch what God does, and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents, mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. This is where we start with our priorities. Number two, we remove the divisions in our heart. Remove the things that are dividing your your heart and your attention. Excuse me. Luke 10 verse 27. Yes, The teacher of the law was right. It does say he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? When you love the Lord wholeheartedly, when you love the Lord, when you commit your whole life to the Lord, what comes out of the overflow is your love for people. But what I can tell you is it's really hard to be divided in your heart if you've already surrendered your whole heart to the Lord. We remove the divisions. Number three, ask God to remove and repair what you cannot see. Ask him to remove and repair what you cannot see. Ezekiel 36 verse 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Family, God desires that we are not to be hard-hearted in life. And the beautiful thing is, God's already planned ahead so many things for us, so many things. But he does ask us to guard our hearts. He does ask us to be wise. He provides wisdom from the Holy Spirit, but he asks us to seek that wisdom. He's already made provisions to help us in whatever is to come. We just have to trust him, his word, and surrender Life is an opportunity, family. I'll say it again. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for great joy, for great favor. But you know what your heart issues are. You know what the attitudes are that you struggle with. We all know what we struggle with in our own hearts. You just have to admit it. You provide the answer to the Lord of what it is he can work on in your heart because you don't have to walk through life with a spiritual heart condition. My challenge for you today is don't allow the attitudes of your heart to impact the way that you love others, but more importantly, the way that you love God. Let him purify your heart today. Psalm 51 verse 10 says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I want you to stand to your feet. If you're in this place today and you would say, there have been attitudes in my heart that I can see, that I can realize. God wants us to live with a right attitude, with a right heart. When I have gone to the grocery store or the, to a shop of some sort before, you know how they offer you the cart or the basket? Have you ever been silly enough to grab the basket? I, I always think that it'll be a good idea. If you grab the basket, okay, and you say, I'm just going to get a couple things here. I'm just going just gonna to put a couple things in my basket. And you place that, that, those couple things in, and then you place 10 more, and you 
place a few more beyond that is anybody else as ridiculous as I am. I find reason to need all the things. And you find a blanket that you're like, I need that too. I don't have space. I'm going to put it over my shoulder. And then I need a, a big old thing of water. So I Hercules that. And before you know it, you're walking around like this with your trusty basket over here full of things. And everything else is on your shoulders until the moment when you realize, but there's a cart right over there. I can offload all my stuff into that cart and I don't have to cart it around the store. Maybe all this is important, but I don't have to carry it all. The same is true in relationship with Jesus. The things that we allow into our heart are because we didn't trust Jesus with them first and we took them upon our shoulders. We took the weight upon our shoulders. Maybe it was the imperfection of life. You took it upon your shoulders. You carried the shame. You carried the need to think that you had all of the answers and you never did, but it will only make you more arrogant. If you take all of the pain of people's poor choices in relation to you and you take it upon your shoulders, it'll only make you more wounded. It's not the heart of God for you. Can we all just close our eyes and open our hands to the Lord? I wanna pray a very simple prayer. Lord, I ask you that you would purify our hearts. Give us clean hands and a clean heart before you, Lord. Whatever has been heavy on our hearts, God, whether it was arrogance and pride, whether it is hurt and betrayal and offensiveness and bitterness, whatever the thing is that we didn't trust you with rightly that weighs so heavy on our hearts, would you just cleanse our hearts today, God, so that we can really hear from you, so we can understand the heart of the Messiah, we can understand your miraculous. We can understand your deliverance. We can understand your power. We can understand your purpose. We can walk in the life that you've called us to. Would you just purify our hearts today? Anyone that came in with a heavy heart, would you just allow that to wash right off of them? Let them feel freedom and peace in this place. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you can go ahead and put your hands down. If you're in this place and you would say, I have not lived with a right heart before the Lord because I've never received Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And today I realize I have been living a life for myself. I have been living a life carrying the basket of everything on my shoulders. I have not experienced the freedom of God that's you today, if today is the day that you realize I need to get my life right with the Lord, I want to remind you that Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved, set free, delivered on this very day. If you're that person and today is your day of salvation for the very first time or if you need to rededicate your life today to the Lord. I would love for you right now with boldness, both of you just lift up your hands all across the room. If it's your first day of salvation, if it's a day to rededicate, I see you over there. I see you over there. I see you down here in front. I see you over here. I see you over there. I see you back there. I see you down here. I see you all across the church. I'm so proud of you. So proud of you. Church family, can we pray, pray a prayer? of salvation together. Would you just repeat this after me? Say, dear Jesus, today I give my heart to you, my whole heart. Lord, all the things, all the areas I've held back from you, I surrender my life to you, Jesus Christ. Today I repent, I ask for forgiveness. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. Today I choose your freedom. You are my Father, you are my Savior, and you are my Lord. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen, amen. Love you, family.